yesterday. Okay, let's change the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go live in about a minute. Um, okay. All right. Well, I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks, uh, Ari team, for, for putting this together. It's going to be awesome. You know, thank you all for coming, for speaking, and good luck to everyone, obviously. This is going to be great. Yeah, it will be great. Clementine, merde, merde, merde. To you all as well. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining this webinar. Um, we're just going to wait a few minutes to allow uh, the people to trickle in as this webinar starts. Okay, so I think it's time for us to get started. Hello, everyone. Marhaban Bijabi. Um, thank you all for coming to our webinar today, um, joining us today for our webinar, Arab Climate Futures. My name is Mejd Al Saif. I'm part of the Environmental Politics Program um, at the Arab Reform Initiative. Um, for those of you who may be a bit unfamiliar with our work or new to our work, um, we are an independent Arab think tank that works with expert partners in the Middle East and North Africa and beyond to articulate a homegrown agenda for democratic change. As part of the environmental politics program, we seek to convene activists, scholars, and policymakers to discuss environmental issues as they intersect with four key areas. Um, these areas are issues of governance, local politics, activism, and local initiatives, and environment and armed conflict. Through these lenses, we aim to kind of look at how issues of the environment link back to wider political systems um, and broader demands for change in the region. We're super excited to be hosting the, our third webinar as part of our environmental politics series uh, today with the European Un Union Institute of Security Studies. And we'll be looking at climate risks and the climate future of the Middle East and North Africa. Before we get started, uh, I just want to go over some housekeeping notes uh, for everyone. So firstly, there is um, Arabic interpretation or sim simultaneous interpretation available um, for this Zoom webinar. You can find this on the lower bar um, labeled interpretation below um, our screen or the, our pictures. You can choose Arabic or English, whatever you prefer um, listening to. Um, إذا بدكم تستمعوا للوبينار بالعربي تقدروا تضغطوا على حبة الinterpretation. You can click on the interpretation. You have access to the interpretation into English or Arabic as you please. Live on Facebook as well. So for our Facebook viewers, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, we will transmit them to the Zoom um, and hopefully get to them. Uh, Lastly, this event is going to be recorded. So if you would like to watch through it again, or if you have to nip out for whatever reason, um, you can watch this back on our website. It'll probably be uploaded um, tomorrow or after tomorrow, um, after the webinar ends. Uh, so with that all said, I'm going to get started in our introduction. So. The Middle East and North Africa is regularly described as one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change in the world and is warming at a much faster rate than the rest of the world. Um, recent years have already shown the impact of environmental degradation in the region on 
both political and social unrest, as severe droughts have often led to the loss of livelihoods, displacement and migration, food insecurity. But despite all of this, climate change is still re relegated as a second priority or a lesser priority in the region. Today, we're hoping to discuss the climate risks posed in the Middle East as presented in the recently published Shayo paper issued by the EU Institute of Security Studies and also the namesake of our webinar, Arab Climate Futures of Risk and Readiness. We've invited the authors of this, pa of this paper, Flor uh, Florence Gulp, who is the deputy director of the EUISS and Clementine Lienard, an, exec an executive trainee um, at the EUISS. And they'll be speaking on their assessment of the risks of climate change in the region, and also the indices that they've developed to capture the vulnerability, preparedness, and mitigation potential of different countries in the Middle East. We're hoping after that to follow up and examine more closely the impact of climate change in two of the most vulnerable countries in the Middle East, Egypt and Iraq respectively. Um, from Egypt, we've invited environmental activist Shadi Khalil, who is the co-founder of Greenish, a social enterprise focused on educating communities about the environment and empowering them to develop solutions for the most pressing challenges facing them. In Iraq, the impact of climate-induced changes, bad governance, and conflict has already been felt throughout the country, most notably on water pollution and scarcity, which is a massive cause for migration, loss of livelihoods, drinking water contamination, and environmental degradation. To speak from Iraq, we've, invi we've invited um, activist Salman Khairallah, who is the executive director of Humad Dijla, or the Tigris Rivers Protectors, uh, Protectors Association, an NGO dedicated to protecting the natural heritage of the Tigris River and championing water conversation, uh, conservation and environmental conservation in the country. We'll be hearing from our speakers for about 10 minutes each, so 40 minutes in total, and we'll be opening up the floor to a Q&A discussion um, for another 40 minutes. So this webinar will be about an hour and a half long. Please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A button, again, below the screen. You can do this as the meeting progresses um, or at any point. Um, and with all that said, I give the floor to you, Florence. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Majd, and uh, thank you to our reform minister for, for co-organizing this event. Actually, it was your initiative. We just wrote the thing, just. Um, so, and thanks especially to Shadi and Salman for joining us because I really did not want this to be an event where the EU talks about the region and what's going on there, but actually this is really, this paper is really a contribution to a conversation that continues to go on. So whoever's listening, our paper, probably in a year or two already will be outdated because new data is coming in, new research is being done, and a lot more needs to be done because the picture is not nearly as detailed as we need it to be to really fight climate change and its effects um, most effectively. So just take it as a, uh, as a what we know so far uh, kind of information and we need to do a lot more. So um, the reason we wanted to write this paper was that we felt that um, environmental sciences were kind of in a different corner than all the other sciences. You know, I'm a political scientist, but there's economists and sociologists and so forth. And they're all looking at the elephant, you know, the tail of the blind men touching the elephant and they're all holding different bits of it. But how do we know what the whole problem will look like? Because we know a, lot, a great deal about climate change, but there's also other human things going on at the same time. And that's why it's called climate futures because it's essentially a foresight paper looking at the different futures that are coming uh, the region's way. So um, we felt we want to bring these different things together. So it's not just cli uh, climate science, it's also other sciences that come together and give, and now this is what I just said, give those people in power. So be it in European states, be it in states in the region, but people that can make a difference, really the latest up to date, because truth is somebody um, I don't know, in a foreign ministry in Germany will probably not know all the science because they just don't have time to read all the IPCC reports. So that was the rationale. And I will not you know, give you all the details because it's a huge document and um, Clementine will talk about the index because we wanted to compile all of this into to make it clearer where the priorities have to be. 
Um, but yeah, the science, uh, Clementine, she, she, she was a faithful warrior again with so much data. It was, it was truly incredible. So obviously, first things first, you all know this, the region will be very much affected by climate change. You just said this. So we'll have for sure 2% increase by 2039, two and a half in the summers. And beyond that, uh, it's anywhere between two and four degrees by 2059. So it depends obviously on how much emissions are cut. So that's just the global thing. If you want to understand how this plays out exactly in environmental terms, that's all in the paper. But I want to give you four points to take away. Um, the first thing is um, that climate change is a global phenomenon, but actually its effect will be felt locally. And this is what bothered me in the conversation because we kept saying, oh yes, the region will be hit very hard, but what does this mean exactly? What does it mean where? And to understand that and actually to prepare against it, you really need to understand what will it do to Beirut? What will it do to, I don't know, this part of the countryside? What will it do to southern Iraq? So the more we know, the more we know about the local effects, the better prepared we are. And of course, the IPCC can now uh, make predictions that are much more detailed than uh, when they first started in the 90s. So uh, it's now five to 20 times more precise than the very first models they had 30 years ago. So we now, uh, they can now make regional assessments as um, specific as between 50 and 25 kilometers. So that's already quite good. In the 90s, it was 500 kilometers, right? So in the 90s, you could make more or less country predictions depending on the size of a country. Um, and today you can actually start making regional, but I think we need even smaller, right? We need city level. So we need to probably be uh, even more granular than that. But for instance, based on that, we know for instance that, so we didn't want to just understand, or we don't just have to understand what will it do to a certain place, but who is in that place? What is in that place? Who lives there and what do they do? And so, for instance, one thing we found was that um, uh, farmers in, uh, in uh, Morocco, for instance, or in northern Iraq that live in the mountains and use snow, melted snow for agriculture, they are normally small scale farmers, right? So that means that they will have almost no possibility to absorb the loss of, uh, of this livelihood. So if it hits a bigger farmer, it would of course have less of an effect. So this is the type of granularity I'm talking about. So um, the more we know about the local effects, the more we will understand what this will do, not just to the environment, but to the people and the animals that live in it. And then what will they do as a result? So just to give you a few ideas, one thing we found was that of course, um, you know, agriculture being really hit by climate change just means that a lot of people will, will move into the city. Now, this is uh, urbanization is, of course, not a phenomenon that is caused by climate change. It exists even without it. But climate change will probably increase it by about 20 percent. That's one of the estimates that we've seen. So uh, by 2030, 62 percent of the people will live in cities. Uh, population of Baghdad will almost double. Uh, between 2010 and 2030, so we're now halfway there. Cairo will reach 38 million uh, in 2050. Um, so this is up from 23 million two years ago. These are all numbers that are not necessarily easy to digest. So I suggest uh, you can you download the paper and look it up, but just keep in mind a lot. A lot of people live in cities and that's ironic because cities is not the place you wanna be in when it gets really hot. Because cities are uh, um, what's called urban heat islands, or they create urban heat island cities for a number of reasons. Concentrate the heat, it has to do with the infrastructure, the density, uh, the fact that there are many people doing many things that all uh, lead to emissions and so forth. So, uh, globalement, uh, the uh, hot days will be really felt in Amman, for instance, in Cairo, number of extreme the hot days is projected to double to about 20 days per year. So extreme heat days, that's, that's of course, uh, and, and actually it's uh, above, above 40 degrees, Baghdad, Beirut even to 40 days. So that feels like, yeah, that's not so bad if it's just 40 degrees, but what if it's much hotter than that? And beyond 2040, that uh, increases further for Beirut and Baghdad, 100 days of extreme heat per year. So that's a third of the year of extreme heat. And if you know, Beirut and you know Baghdad, these are not cities that are built for permanent heat, right? There is a fluctuation in the climate normally. So what does this mean? Um, so think locally to combat climate change. Yes, we need strategic level, but now is the time to prevent and prevention is at the local level. And I think for every Arab city here, there is a task to think comprehensively about its future. 
How many people will live there? How will they move around? We know that in the region, public transport is, is really not that great. Um, you know, depending on city, there's, there's not much access to metro stations, metros or trams or something like that. How will they manage heat? Are there things they can do to reduce the heat? What about water, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a humongous task, but I think it is also an impetus for reform because if, uh, if this isn't an impetus for reform, I don't know what it is. So the cities are in the front line. The second point is, I said just in the beginning that climate is not isolated. I think this is where our study is different from the others because we created a 3D model of human society in the future, essentially, you can see it like that. Uh, we looked at all the trends that are going on, not just climate change, but also other ones. And unfortunately we found some trends that will make it more complicated. I just mentioned urbanization, uh, but the other big, big trend is of course population growth. So uh, we already know, and this was actually quite a shock for me, that several of the problems in the region, when it comes to water, for instance, are unrelated to climate change. They're just due to population growth. So um, between, well, up to half of the increasing demand for water is due to growing population living in cities and engaging in economic activity. So climate is not alone to blame. It's, it's also the fact that there's just a bigger population that needs to be managed. Same goes for Jordan, for instance, one calculation said that 89% of the country's water demand will be um, uh, the result of, um, sorry, that's actually a different, different data, but just, just remember that uh, population growth makes, puts even more pressure on water resources. And of course, it's related to food import dependency. Um, uh, so in the 1960s, 10% of the food in the region was imported. Today, it's 50%. And even without climate change, and that's the scary thing, it's projected to grow to 68% by 7, 2050. So within 30 years, the region will import almost three quarters of its food. And if you remember the Arab Spring, you know that food price is subject to huge volatility. So it can go up and down very, very nervously. And that's bad for people, it's bad for governments, it's bad for the economy. Um, but it is related to the fact that the, that the national agricultures are not equipped to uh, feed so many people. <clears throat> One thing we found was that um, in part, it's not the only thing, but in part it's also because water is not well managed. So, you know, we found all these things where you realize, okay, here we can do things better, here we can do things better. So do not walk away today thinking, oh my God, everything will be horrible. There is a good chance that a lot of things will go really wrong, but there's also a lot of improvement possible. So I see this actually as a huge chance um, for reform to you know, re recycle wastewater, reduce water wastage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, fact is uh, four countries in particular. So even if we, the world reduce our emissions and limit CO2 emissions, uh, temperature, sorry, to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times, four countries in the region will be impacted by water shortage regardless. So Algeria, Iraq, Morocco, and Tunisia, uh, for them, the best case scenario is not a best case scenario. The best case scenario is already not longer possible for them. So these four countries, for sure, no matter what happens, um, they are gonna be hit. They have to think about um, how to reduce um, water spending, so to speak. And um, this is again, something where the holistic look helps us to understand how population growth affects or, or multiplies climate change challenges. Then there's a third finding I really want to stress. So um, in, 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 sorry, let me just have a sip. It's kind of a stereotype that people in the region don't care about climate change. <coughs> Maz, you said you're right. Most polls show that it's not a priority to compare to other things like the economy or security. Um, and it's true that in 2008, we found one survey, so that's uh, 15 years ago almost, uh, the region ranked second only to Sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to climate change unawareness. Almost half of the population said they had never heard of it. Fast forward today, the Middle East North Africa is behind Europe, the second region in the world that says that climate change is a very or somewhat serious concern. So I think that's, I mean, I cannot stress this enough. So uh, with that, the region is uh, ahead of Latin America or Asia um, or other regions. So uh, really behind Europe, number two, 64% uh, of Arabs. So that's <coughs> two thirds. 
Um, if you look at by country level, it's very interesting because of course there's differences. Kuwait is the country where uh, the, the number is the lowest, a minority feels that way, but Algeria, Jordan, Lebanon, Sudan, more than two thirds of the population think it's a very serious concern. So I think that's, that's pretty spectacular news. What I also found interesting, another survey showed us that in contrast to Europeans, Arab citizens feel that climate change will actually directly uh, relate to war. So really like existential war. So this is something that's, that's a huge change compared to 15 years ago. There is a real awareness. And in addition, we, we also measured um, uh, tangential issues or you know, um, things that are related to climate change, but perhaps not seen that way, such as waste, water, and air pollution. So 90% of rep respondents across the region feel that water pollution is a very serious, a serious or very serious problem. I assume we're gonna hear about Iraq in a second. That's of course, I think um, the, the best example, uh, the worst example in a way, what's going on in the Southern uh, provinces concerning how you know, water pollution is actually a political problem and can become a security problem. And uh, you saw waste, something that I discovered during the study, 10% of the region's emissions are from waste. So garbage actually is also a climate change related problem. So what I find interesting is that, so people are, you know, two thirds of people are, say it's a very or serious problem, but almost 90% of people say water, air and waste is a huge issue and all three are related to climate change. So this is something that really can be leveraged because that's a behavioral change of people, but also how governments will be pushed to change. That's a huge thing that we can tap into. And I want to end on the note of climate justice. Um, we know, of course, that the region has not started climate change. It has contributed in total since 1850. So since this whole thing started, 3% uh, of global CO2 emissions. Um, so it will be hit disproportionately hard. And if that's not unfair, I don't know what it is. Uh, and it's fair to say that the EU, for instance, recognizes that. Uh, Commission President von, von der Leyen said that the EU and the US have, a, I quote here, a special duty. Um, and of course, you know, you've heard in context of the last COP that uh, several states, um, industrialized states, did not contribute to the climate fund or not enough. The EU was not one of them. Okay? The EU did pay and actually topped up its payment. But the problem is is not just money. And I think the money is, is one important step. Um, and the EU has to put, push the others, such as the US, to pay more. But the thing is that um, it's for a long time, the conversation about climate change was, well, the industrialized countries started it, so they should stop cutting emissions, whereas we, the developed countries, can continue to uh, emit. First of all, the Gulf states are not developing countries. Um, Saudi Arabia is the chief emitter in the region. Uh, so I really think that argument doesn't really hold true. The other thing that shocks me really is that today the region is at the level of almost Europe when it comes to emissions. So Europe has decreased emissions since the 90s and the region has continued to increase. That's not sustainable. That's not sustainable for the region itself. It's also not sustainable for the rest of the world. But if you're already sitting in the front line, maybe don't continue to put wood in the fire. Uh, four of the world's 20 most emitting cities in absolute terms, so not relative, are located in the region. So it's Riyadh, it's Dubai, but it's also uh, a few others, uh, one in Egypt, one in Kuwait, smaller cities. Um, so that's a problem, or so one of the many things we can complain about, because we know since 2007, the IPCC issued a study in 2007 saying the main emitter stopping emissions will not be able to stop climate change. So we know, we've known for more than 15 years for more yeah, that that uh, the region and others of course also have to stop so i think the, this conversation about justice uh, is an important one i think we need transfer of of technology transfer of knowledge and we need funds of course but in addition the region itself has to start mitigation and adaptation because it simply has no time to lose um, in sum i think we bring pretty disturbing news you can read more details in the report but we can, there's also a lot that can be done. It's not, um, it's not all lost and we have a, a decade that we can really leverage. My concern is, will we lose time because other things like conflict uh, and war will distract us yet again? And uh, with that, I think it's over to Pino Thank you, Florence. Thank you so much. Um, 
that added nuance that we do need when discussing climate change and politicizing climate change is so necessary. Um, thank you for your intervention. Just for clarification, because I see this question and in case other people might have this question, by region, are you referring to the Arab world or the wi wider MENA uh, region? I'm an Arabist, so I always mean the Arab world. So <laughs> okay. uh, apologies to the to Turks and the Iranians and the Israelis, but that's, that's just how I see it. Oh, that's how my framework has put this way, yes. But of Thanks. course, the region, the region, you know, in the geographic sense, climate change will not stop at the border. It will affect all the others. But to keep it cohesive, it's basically at the League of Arab States. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, OK, with that, I give the floor to you, Clementine. Thank you very much, Mesh, for this introduction. Um, can I ask, please, for the presentation? It's coming. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to say that I am very happy to be here and to present our uh, paper results. It's been such a journey. Uh, this, this report has been such a journey. It was a very dense research. Uh, and we finally managed to put everything together with the, with the climate risk index. But I will talk more about it later. So first of all, I would like to say that, uh, as Florence said and raised, um, potential climate impacts in the regions are, are well known. Uh, the projections are clear. If the world keeps producing emissions at the same pace, which is what we call the as, the as usual business scenario, temperatures will rise between 2 and 3.3 degrees across the region by 2050. Uh, this means that rains will be more erratic. It will be either heavier or will decline. Droughts are expected to be more severe and longer, while floods are projected to be more frequent. So all of these climate facts have domino effects in the region and amplify pre-existing problems. Uh, water, as we mentioned, is already a rare commodity and food resources will decline uh, and prices are projected to rise as well. Cities will be hotter and urban people will be exposed to more extreme climate conditions, especially those living in slums. And as Florent said, farmers uh, are um, expected to uh, lose their livelihoods and, and jobs in agriculture are, are at high risk, uh, as well jobs in tourism. Uh, there is a high political and security price for this. Uh, these are all factors that can lead to civil unrest, movements of population, and in the worst case, eruption of violent conflicts. Uh, indeed, uh, there are tensions over the share of resources, uh, and they can increase further. Uh, it is something that is already prominent in the region, especially for the use of water resource. Uh, currently, uh, tensions between Egypt and Ethiopia over the use of the Nile River are very high. So all of these give a broad regional picture of the climate crisis, but it does not say much about the level of preparedness uh, Arab states have. So when we did this research, this research, sorry, we decided to look at the level of risk from climate change per country into more details. Uh, at a more national level, because as Florence said, it's really important to be uh, as localized as possible, um, especially when we know that Arab states are not confronted to the same threats. So temperatures will not rise at the same level between and inside the countries. And for example, when we take Egypt and Iraq, uh, we know that they are highly vulnerable to sea level rise and floods, for instance, uh, which is not the case for Algeria or the UAE. So uh, this really changes the way countries will engage actions. Um, in order to understand more what climate change really means, uh, we think that looking at exposure to risks is not sufficient. Uh, mitigation potential and preparedness must also be measured. So um, we really wanted to understand who is the most at risk in the region from climate change uh, in order to enable policy prioritization. So as you can see on the screen with the full results, uh, we created a comprehensive climate risk index. Uh, and this is mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So I will make a short overview of what our index is, how we built it. Uh, I will also talk about its limits and I will present the results. Um, uh, just to let you know that the, the index, the full uh, results can be, can be found at chapter four of our report. Andrew, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So we know that climate change is not just about the environment and biodiversity. So the climate risk index reflects how it will, it will impact the Arab societies as a whole. And that's why the index takes into account all climate related sectors. So you can see them on the left uh, side of, of the screen. 
So the climate-related sectors are those that will be impacted by climate change, uh, water and food resources, ecosystem, and the environment. Uh, those which feed climate change, uh, mostly uh, pollution, emissions from waste transportation, from agriculture, industry, or even tourism. And those which can change the course of impacts of climate change in the future. And here I'm talking about uh, renewable energy capacities and potential policy implementation, governance, or awareness from public or institutions, as Florence mentioned uh, before. So our climate risk index counts more than 90 indicators, uh, where data were transposed from zero, which means high risk, to five, which means low risk, until 2059. And we divided the index into three categories that you can see on the right side of the screen. Uh, the first category aims to present how sustainable are the societies today, how they perform their resources management, how they manage water, how they manage food, how they manage waste, how they rely on energy, how they pollute, how aware they are and how safe they are. And the second category displays the projections on climate vulnerability and projections on future climate related trends. Uh, all the trends that can interact with climate change direct effects, uh, either mitigating them or, or uh, entering into collision. So we talk about uh, demographics, population growth, consumption patterns, uh, potential for sustainable economy. So the second category is really a foresight one. Uh, we decided to use projections under the as usual business scenario and provide projections for uh, 2030 and 2050 to 2059. The last category assesses the level of state's preparedness. Uh, it analyzes their readiness to act and their capabilities to implement changes. And here we mostly look at uh, strategic planning and governance performance. Um, unfortunately, uh, the index also has limits because uh, we really suffered from lack of data, especially for war affected countries in the region, uh, Syria, Libya, Palestine, Yemen, and Iraq. Uh, some of the results must therefore be scaled down, especially for Iraq and Palestine, uh, because this is exactly where uh, data were missing uh, that we expect them to be uh, to show very bad performance. So, for example, for Iraq, uh, we miss data for the energy transition readiness or to measure uh, quality of water. Um, now, I would like to talk about the index results and what it what is the the, the outcome. So, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So when we look at the results, uh, we can see that the two best prepared countries are the United Arab Emirates and Jordan, while the two countries most at risk uh, are Syria and Libya. But more generally, the index shows that countries of the region can be divided into three categories. We have on the one hand, the GCC countries. Uh, they display a lower level of climate risk, a lower level of vulnerability to climate change and to other climate related trends than the rest of the region. Um, they also present a higher potential for a sustainable economy and a more performant governance. Then on the second hand, we have Maghreb countries and Jordan. They, are not, they don't rank uh, far behind the Gulf states, uh, but according to the projections, they are more vulnerable to climate change and environment, environmental effects, sorry, but they also present a higher level of political readiness, especially when we look at Morocco and Jordan. Um, on another side, we have war affected countries that I, those that I mentioned before and Lebanon, which are, however, the most at risk from climate change, showing very low level of both political readiness and political capabilities. When we look a bit closer at Iraq, uh, the country presents really bad performance when it comes to resilience to a low carbon transition, for instance, and is lacking strategic planning to achieve food security. And when we look at the score on current food management performance, we can see that uh, this, is, this is really bad as well. Um, there is one country that doesn't fit uh, any of those categories, it is Egypt. Uh, despite showing good levels of ambitions and political readiness, it is by far from the rest of the region the most vulnerable to climate change direct effects. And it is also highly vulnerable to future resources management due to its highly popu um, growing population. Um, to conclude, I would like to say that the index shows that the Arab states are not equal when it comes to being at risk from climate change. Uh, it will be easier for non-war affected countries and countries with greater financial resources like, like the GCC countries to cope with the climate crisis. 
it really shows that already fragile states are really, really in danger and are the least prepared. So um, it is very important that climate change assistance um, be integrated into conflict resolution and conflict, conflict prevention initiatives, uh, especially from external actors. Uh, we realized in the study that uh, most of the climate assistance uh, are focused on countries that are not at war, at war in the region, mostly Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, and Morocco, uh, from the EU side, I mean. Uh, also, when we look closer at the index, it also reveals that uh, many improvements can be undertaken, and this everywhere in the region. Uh, for instance, when we look at Egypt, we can see that it presents bad level of performance when it comes to sustainable tourism. Uh, Iraq and Lebanon reuse only 3% of their treated wastewater so they can improve water management. The UAE, Saudi Arabia and Algeria have also bad level of performance when it comes to air quality and sustainable public transport system. And when, I, when we look at uh, renewables and uh, renewable energy, we can see that the region has a great but untapped solar potential. So my final, my final word would be that the region is now at a crossroad. There is room to act. Uh, the extent to which the countries are at risk from climate change will mostly depend on actions that are enhanced to tackle down the effects of climate change. And this, as Florence said, has to be, uh, has to be enhanced both in the region and outside. Thank you so much, Clementine. Thank you so much, Florence, for these interventions. Um, something that this paper does amazingly well, and I think is really necessary to add into this conversation around climate change in the region, uh, in the region is this element of nuance that we've really lacked when looking at environmental degradation. Again, um, to reiterate what you were both saying about um, really looking at how climate change is experienced on the local level, what the human experiences of this are going to be like, and how all elements of society interacts with it. I guess having an interdisciplinary vision of climate change and how this will affect our futures. So thank you so, uh, thank you so much both for your interventions. Um, on that note, we are going to move to our next two panelists, um, both involved in environmental activism, um, to further kind of this point of localizing the perspective of climate change in the, in the region. How has it felt um, on the ground? How has it felt in these very vulnerable countries? Um, and we'll start with Shadi, Shadi Khalil, um, and speaking from his perspective in Egypt. So I give the floor to you, Shadi. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Majd, and thank you all. Uh, I'm very excited and honored to be part of this panel and reading the report uh, is making me happy uh, despite the shocking facts um, because the lack of information like you all discussed is, uh, is a huge issue when it comes to, to how should we act as environmental activists, as governments in the, in the Arab region. So this kind of report uh, give us a roadmap, make us understand the magnitude of the problem and it's very, very important on uh, on how we work as an environmental activist, how we lobby, how we uh, decide to put uh, priorities on the issues that we're going to work on. The moment I read the report, I started sharing it with my colleagues in Egypt and also uh, environmental activists from all over the MENA. And uh, I felt excited that I have a resource in my hands. So thank you so much for the effort uh, and all the time that you spend doing this. Uh, uh, my name is Shadi Khalil, and I'm the co-founder of Greenish. I represent a group of environmental activists in Egypt. Uh, Greenish started in 2017 under the mission of uh, providing environmental knowledge uh, and awareness, and especially in Arabic. Uh, what Greenish started like after a tour we did around Egypt, and whenever we uh, were trying to raise awareness about climate change and talking to different communities, the thing that we would hear from them that we don't care about the polar bears uh that this kind of language does not represent people in egypt or in the MENA region it's something far and distant and it's imported this is the word that they use uh yes uh they like like the report shows uh, climate change as as it's projected is not a priority uh for uh people in egypt but the impacts of climate change is a priority economic impact uh impacts related to gender impacts related to uh to health is a priority to people in egypt and this is why the narrative need to be changed and this is what greenish focus on 
We focus on shifting the narrative. We focus on reflecting language that people would understand uh, and represent them. Uh, we work with thousands of students all over Egypt uh, on producing content. We have manuals related to climate change and different fields like biodiversity, clean energy, and uh, waste management, like different domains. Uh, those manuals are developed by community members, are developed by the students, they are interactive and they are being taught and practiced all over Egypt. And then we support the students with projects that they come up with in order to uh, mitigate uh, uh, climate change impact or to adopt. Uh, we supported 20 projects all over Egypt uh, uh, last year. Uh, and this year we, we have 2000 students uh, enrolled uh, um, in different universities and schools around Egypt. Uh, so this being said, uh, in Egypt in general, like for during the past three years, we see a lot of support and a lot of understanding in terms of uh, governmental support, uh, international attention, uh, NGOs being enrolled uh, uh, and starting up working on climate change uh, activism. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this, is make, this is making us like not feeling alone, it's making the community growing bigger and it's adding a momentum. This momentum is great. Um, I remember like when we started Greenish, we we felt that we were great, crazy. We felt that we were, were alone. Right now, this is normal. This is a normal debate and people understand why it's important for climate change and on environmental issues in Egypt. So this is a huge shift in such a short time, I would say, uh, from my experience. Uh, but again, we struggle a little bit with the uh, scenario of economic growth. Uh, which is, I think, in many countries in the MENA region, uh, how we uh, how we are uh, like as governments and as people are like hoping to have like more jobs, more economic growth, and this uh, stands as a barrier to sustainability to a certain extent. Uh, so it's an issue of like breaking down the narrative and trying to to see how can we uh, create prosperity and create. Uh, uh, good economic impact, good well-being, uh, and good uh, quality of life uh, without the regular economic growth uh, module that we have seen. Um, this is why we need researchers like this in order to quantify the damage, to understand what kind of cost this economic growth is going to cost us. So now we measure it like in terms of a GDP, how is this going to bring jobs and money like per year, but we want to see the impact over a scale of time. And this is why quantifying the impact at this moment and like also trying to understand how it will affect the health of the people, how much money is going to be uh, spent on the health system, on uh, on, the, on, the mitig on the adaptation and uh, on, on the migration, on, uh, on the economic losses that is going to be recreated and reproduced uh, in the future. So this is very important and this is why this kind of information is, is critical and we need more of this. Um, in Egypt in general, like, like the report said, water scarcity and the conflicts around the Nile is, uh, is one big issue uh, of how uh, the food security is going to be affected. Uh, the government is starting new projects like the new Delta because Delta is going to be affected. Uh, Nile Delta, which is um, it's an area around the Nile that uh, a lot of food uh, uh, production relies on in Egypt. Uh, so there are different projects that are being introduced right now, but water scarcity is uh, is a huge issue. Uh, the sea level rise uh, in different cities like Alexandria, for example, you see it every uh, winter how the coastal city is being affected uh, and how people are reacting to it. So especially right now in Alexandria, uh, how the, the transportation uh, completely shut down like uh, at certain days, how people suffer like going to their work or like do doing their daily activities, how is it going to affect people going to hospitals, needing urgent help, um, especially people in a situation of housing that it's not going to makes them resilient to this kind of weather and uh, uh, changes. Also, uh, farmers in the Delta, uh, especially like with the, with the salinity of the land uh, um, being different and them experiencing different trends, it's very fast for them to adopt. 
uh, different crops like a mango, especially like last summer in Egypt, and how the entire uh, uh, mango uh, production uh, was, I think, almost like 60 or 70 percent less uh, mm -hmm. during the past year, and how it affected the exports as well. Coral reefs uh, in the Red Sea and how it affected tourism. Egypt rely a lot on tourism in terms of economic impact, and a lot of jobs are created toward tourism. So, so currently in Egypt and especially in the future, there's going to be a lot of impacts that's going to affect the economy, uh, but also uh, a huge part that we uh, we look at, especially in greenish, is also uh, women uh, and the level of violence. Uh, especially like with economic uh, with with economic problems and how how women are on the front line of this fight, mm. uh, especially like a lot a lot of uh, main household providers are women uh, uh, at this point. Uh, this is the this is mainly uh, reflecting on uh, uh, on the report. One one last thing I want to. Uh, I want to share uh, is how uh, the momentum uh, over climate change is increasing and how uh, it's great thing that Egypt is hosting the COP this year and also taking a leadership role uh, in terms of negotiations. Uh, and I, I, I was fortunate enough to attend the COP uh, this year, uh, last year, sorry, in, uh, uh, in the UK. Uh, and I feel that climate finance is a huge part of the debate, which is absolutely important. Uh, it's very necessary for for uh, countries from the for developed countries to to be accountable for the historical uh, contribution to the crisis that we are facing right now. Uh, but also like how the climate finance is going to uh, be distributed, how it's going to to go to the most vulnerable, how the marginalized community are going to be on the front line of this is very very important. Uh, also, uh, mitigation efforts uh is very very important so not only adaptation and not only relying on climate finance climate finance is very important like i i don't want to undermine this but also it's very important to look into how it's being distributed how it reaches the most vulnerable and how uh how it also contribute to uh, uh mitigation not only adaptation Thank you so much, Shadi, for that intervention. Um, I'm really grateful that we got to hear what it's actually how how these effects are actually felt in Egypt on the local society on the local society. And I think this is really when it starts to show kind of again that essence those nuances of middle eastern culture middle, middle eastern society egyptian society how are things felt on the very local level and i think you raised a really important point about you know examples of how it's felt in egypt and also that important point about how we see the effects of climate change in very different languages you know in very different kind of scenarios and we speak about it differently and that still is very important to recognize for what it is um, so thank you for again for that intervention. Um, and with that, I think that's a good segue um, with Selman. Selman will be speaking about Iraq um, and himself as a water protector. Um, so Selman, I give the floor to you as well. Thank you, Maj. Thank, thank you. Thanks a lot for you and for the Arab Reform Initiative for this opportunity you gave it to us just to show what we are facing actually here in, 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 in the MENA region and Middle East in general, or in all this area, and what we are facing right now with all this uh, sad news and sad information and sad data that we got it. At least I want to raise one good news that I had it today because yesterday or two days ago, actually, uh, the Iraqi Republic finally they are they are accepting to do a special ministry just for the environment. Finally, so we will have a special. Uh, ministry just to focus on environment things here inside Iraq, which is something great for last 10 years. We don't have any environmental uh, ministry here inside Iraq. 
and they did this actually after after the signing of the Paris uh, Agreement the, in, in, in the beginning of last year. And this is what they did actually. And this is only the, the good news that I want to raise. Before I talk what we are facing actually here inside Iraq, and I want also to raise in the beginning some challenge that we face it in the Mesopotamia, uh, in this region in Mesopotamia, when I, as you know, Mesopotamia is those, uh, countries is uh, Turkey, Iran, Syria, Iraq, and the Kurdistan region between all those uh, four countries. So, so what 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 they are facing in, in in last five years is all the climate change and everything start to raise up uh, and start with the with with the water, especially especially starting with the water uh, and and there is no rain for 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 uh, for more than half of the year they just have two months a year there is rain or there is snow to collecting in very bad way collecting all and restorage these things because we as a humad dijla we are against building big dams because this is something horrible we thought and what we what we see from all the expecting and from all the reports that the big dams is is is, uh, is a part of the climate change is a part of affecting all the system and the ecosystem here in this, in this all around all the world so this is the point also in Mesopotamia, Tigris River and Euphrates River. Uh, all the civilization and the old civilization 12,000 years ago, it depends on this to, to, uh, time is around 7,000 years ago. So uh, all, all this challenge that we face right now, uh, it's, it's because of those two rivers. Uh, the sharing of the water, using the water as a weapon, Using the water just uh, just like for war, it, it, what's what's happened last year? Something no one can accept it. What's happened between between Turkey and Al Hasaka? Turkish could, uh, Turkish government they cutting the water for Al Hasaka, which is in in, in Rojava area in northeast Syria in Nice. So they cutting the water for more than three million people. They don't have access for the drinkable water. And here inside Iraq, we don't have even enough water because more than 70% of our water coming from outside. I just want to show to you how we are managing our water inside Iraq. And this is our problem with the negotiation with our neighbor countries to have a good, a good water and, and a good percentage of water for the agriculture, for, for the uh, farmer and for the drinkable water. And at least in the end, we need it for our marshes because our marshes is part of the World Heritage List uh, from six years ago, which is something we should look after them also. Uh, actually, now I, I, I want to talk about internally inside Iraq and what we are facing with the water management. Actually, the water management inside Iraq it, it divided to the two parts. The first part, it depends on the, uh, it depends on the, on, on the government itself because the government Till now, they cannot implement the law on the people. We have more than 2,000, uh, 23,000 uh, use over for the water here inside Iraq for the agricultural land and the, and the farmers, because the farmer here in south part of Iraq, they are still using the Sumerian method to the irrigation with the water irrigation. They just open a canal or put a, put a bumping station on, on a river and, and took all the water directly to, to their lands uh, directly, which is something horrible to use the water in this way. When we want to compare it with the with 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 with, with the area that it, it was controlled by Daesh, like Ambar and Salahuddin and Mosul, they after Daesh they start to use the new method for the like dropping system or shower system for the irrigation, which is something we find it we, we found it in the end that that this two, two area, if we want to compare it 
that's something that's something that we can realize that in south they should change this kind of things but unfortunately the government they didn't support the farmers and they didn't uh, negotiate the farmers how they can put a system and 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 put 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 a strategy to change all this old method in this area uh, and, and also i want to mention something that we are faced right now like last week last week uh, for 18 or, 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 or for 15 years, we didn't see any uh, snow inside inside Ambar or inside Erbil. It's it's okay in Kurdistan region, only in the mountain there is a snow, but because of climate change and what we are facing, there is a snow and the flood always inside the city, especially in Kurdistan region, which is something uh, make a big challenge, especially for the IDBs and those people in the camps. Uh, the people in the camps, they, they just have a tents and with this, with all this snow, they have a horrible life to live in. So this is one of the points also that civil society is fighting for right now here inside Iraq. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, before closing my, 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 uh, my speech, I want to talk also about the marshes and what we are facing in the marshes. Uh, the Iraqi marshes is uh, in, in a word, start to be in our heritage list in last uh in last uh in 2016 uh so it's it start to be and and the and and the unesco actually given to iraq a lot of recommendation they should do it and unfortunately the iraq government is still didn't do anything because we don't have enough storage of water. This is one, uh, I, I want to show you this video. This video is in spring and usually last spring. And usually in spring, we should have a lot of water inside inside the marshes, at least from the, from the, this is the video. <laughs> Look, unfortunately, all this area, the, all the spots, there is no water for the spots. And usually, all this area, there is water more than three meters. And this is an Rehweza marsh, which is a marsh uh, between Iraq and Iranian side. And usually, there is three meter uh, the depth of the water here in this marshes. But now, there is no water in this marshes. And like a few years ago, like in 2018 or in the beginning of 2019, we have around more than four meters in this area, in the same area. So this is the challenges that we faced here. And in the end, I, want, I just want to mention something about the, the civil society and what we are doing right now on a climate change. Actually, on a climate change, the Iraqi government, they, they want to start from the end of what the European country they did from the the European country actually start to, to fighting actually with, with the climate change and with the green uh, and, and, and eco-friendly things from from years ago we just start right now so right now so we should start from the zero point and the Iraq government no they want to start from the from the the, the stage 10 not from the stage number zero and, and and this is what what's make a lot of negotiation that we and all the international organization that we did with the Iraqi government like we and UNDP we're running right now a, a, a project just to talk about just to do a survey to see how we can change uh, uh, how, how how we can change the behavior of the local community with with about uh, uh, to 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 solve all the climate change uh, using the water the green zones all this kind of things that the co local community it depends on a local community as you know that climate change it depends on two levels the first one is the local community and the second one also it depends on the governments around the world to help us in the end i just want to mention that from all the countries that solidarity is one of the best way that we use it as a, as a civil society so we always if we cannot do anything but we can at least make a solidarity with another countries by posting on social media platforms or anywhere just to supporting and pushing another countries to do something for the for the for the MENA region or for the arab countries here in this region thank you so much 
Thank you so much, Salman, for your intervention. Um, again, seeing actually trying to en envisioning what climate change looks like on the local level, the water situation in Iraq. I think Iraq is also a very uh, crucial, really, example to think about climate change. There's this kind of ongoing debate within climate change research circles about does conflict cause climate change, climate change causes conflict, but really Iraq is a good example of how it's cyclical and things really feed into one another. And I'm really grateful that you were able to kind of show us and help us envision what these effects are, how these effects are felt locally. Um, so thank you to all our speakers for your interventions. We're going to move on to about 30 minutes for Q&A now. Um, I think it might be interesting to address some of the questions around the indices first of um, the report on uh, Arab climate futures. I'll probably direct these to you, Clementine. Um, but, and I think you, maybe if you'd like to, I'll say them at once. So someone asked, has asked in the chat how, um, what are, uh, how old is the data used in preparing the report and what kind of data have you been using in developing these indices? Um, uh, yeah, over to you. Uh, thanks for the questions. So uh, most of the data we use for the index are from 2020 and 2021. Uh, the, older, the eldest data we have are from 20, uh, 2017 and are from the FAO. They are the latest data available about uh, water management and water resources. But most of them are from 2020, 2021, and some of them are from 2019. Um, also, uh, we have 90 indicators. You can find uh, the list, the full list of all the indicators in Annex 1 uh, of the report. At the end of the report, they are all uh, detailed. We used uh, completely like very different types uh, of uh, indicators. Um, they are all from uh, reliable um, uh, organizations, mostly from the World Bank, the FAO, uh, UN Population Division, uh, World Energy Council, etc. This is also, uh, there are also many uh, indicators that we created ourselves and we made the calculations ourselves based on other uh, data. Uh, for example, we decided to uh, calculate some ratio about how much a country pollutes compared to its uh, uh, share of uh, on earth, like how big is the country uh, compared to its uh, uh, greenhouses emissions, how how much the country pollutes compared to it to the size of its population like uh, in the world um, and they are really really different uh, form of indicators uh, also i can see that someone is asking how is readiness uh, measured can i answer this one as well Majd? so it was kind of difficult it was really tricky because we, we really thought about it for a long time with florence like how can we measure something that we cannot quantify um, and finally, we decided just to take all the sectors that uh, I mentioned before and that are uh, integrated into the, into the index. So food, water, and everything that will be impacted by climate change or will impact itself climate change, feeding the, the rise of temperature. And we decided to set whether there was strategic planning uh, for this particular sector. If it was a yes, then uh, we added the, the best grade. If it was a no, then we added the best, the, the worst grade. Um, it is a bit simple, but uh, it was the best way to measure because it really, we cannot quantify um, uh, qualitative researches and qualitative documents. Also, we measured how, uh, um, how involved into uh, environmental, like, I mean, international environmental affairs and agreements countries were, uh, how much budget they dedicated to uh, environment protection, et cetera, et cetera. And for governance, we also uh, used the data from um, uh, the data from the World Bank on uh, worldwide governance indicators that are from 2021. Can I just, can, yeah, can I just uh, add something to it? I think it's very important to understand the purpose of this index. Uh, I don't, uh, I'd like to quote um, Gal Dornick from the sci-fi series uh, Foundation, which is about mathematical predictions. And she says, math is never about numbers. Numbers help us express things we can't express otherwise. 
So the numbers are designed to, um, you know, what Shadi said earlier, to create visibility in a field that um, where we don't understand what's actually going on. So it is imperfect by definition because we don't have all the data. And even if we had all the data, what does what do numbers mean? What we wanted to ex explain was that not all states, so for instance, look at the UAE, not all states will be hit just by temperature, right? So the UAE will be hit and it's already very hot and it will get hotter, but it has many other things going for it. That's why it comes out pretty well because it actually is already managing high temperatures. So it will just have to manage them a bit better. It has resources, uh, et cetera. It has also, you know, it's quite forward looking, trying to, you know, move quickly into solar and so forth. So it's important to understand that because if you look just at the temperature increase, you would get the idea that the UAE is actually doing pretty badly but Egypt uh, is gonna look okay. So this is important for decision makers in the EU, for instance, because the way there are a lot of resources, where, where does their attention go? So it will engage, I guess, Saudi Arabia more on awareness raising and more on Egypt perhaps with common projects. So that's the idea of the index to keep it relative. We added Sweden as a comparative. Originally we were thinking, should we also add France and Germany and then, it became really complicated because Europeans are also not doing so well. So just because you don't have a five, five is super high risk, doesn't mean that you're doing well, but it's a, it's a relative expression. And so with readiness, we wanted to show have these states started to think about what's gonna come their way. Uh, if yes, then that was a bonus point. But again, Clementine and I had this conversation, Egypt, I think uh, that was also one of the questions that was asked. Egypt has a whole um, a list, it's actually one of the states that has the most initiatives going on uh, in the region. And Kimontin said, yeah, but do we know if they're gonna implement them? We don't know, I can't tell you that, but we can judge them on whether they have them because we know for sure that if you don't have a plan, it's gonna be worse. And as Kimontin said, where we had no data, we decided to give the worst grade. So that also might give people, uh, um, well, people give states a, a worse grade than they deserve, but we figured if there's no data, it means nobody looked at it and that's bad news in itself. So keep that in mind, the index is not a religion, it's, a, it's an indicator to create a bit more visibility and to serve as a basis for discussion like this one. And uh, just because somebody asked, can I perhaps much just jump on it since I'm on it, just on Egypt, why is Egypt bringing uh, the COP? Um, well, it's in Egypt's interest beyond all the things that all the issues we have with the Egyptian government, I have to tell, I have to give them credit for recognizing that they're gonna be hit extremely hard. And the issue with Ethiopia over the Nile Dam is really not what they need right now. Um, so for Egypt, you know, when you remember the index, so you have the states on the upper end, which are gonna be more or less okay because they have the resources. You have those at the lower end, all the conflict countries, really sorry, in the shit. Those in the middle are the ones where I think our effort uh, will make a huge difference because you can actually help Egypt avoid the worst or, or Iraq or, or Algeria. So I think um, uh, for Egypt, it's a make or break it. They're not doomed to it, but uh, if, they, if they don't do the right things now, then they will be. So I think that's the, the rationale for stepping up the game and really becoming a leader in this conversation. I'm going to add to that um, and just mention another question um, asking about um, what concretely could be done to reduce this risk. And I think this ties into some of the policy recommendations that are made towards the end of the paper. Um, Florence and Clementine, if you want to mention something about that. Clementine, do you wanna go first? Yes, there are many, many things that can be done to, to, to mitigate the impact of climate change. Uh, we, I saw that there was a question about deserts, but on the, on the paper, we mostly focused on how to mitigate, for example, or how to adapt uh, uh, in urban environments, uh, because the paper really focuses on uh, the impact of climate change in cities. Um, what there, there are many things to do. First of all, um, it is acknowledged, and there was a really interesting report from Irena uh, on that side that uh, the sooner the countries will move to um, renewable energy, especially so solar, the most they will um, they will they will save water. And when we look at the numbers, uh, for example, the Gulf states uh, they can save fifteen percent of their water use and withdrawal. 
uh, by meeting their Paris Agreement targets. So 15% in countries uh, which don't have much uh, water resources, I think it's a lot. Um, there are also many things to do to um, prevent the cities from being hotter, uh, planting trees, for example, uh, adapting the constructions and the building to, um, to, to materials uh, that can cool down the buildings on the roof or on the streets or uh, even inside the building. Uh, this is how the Riyads in Morocco have been constructed for years uh, with pay shows to, uh, to, to, to bring shadows into the, into, the, into the gardens and into the, into the, the buildings. There are many ancient uh, tra traditions in the region that allow to uh, cool down the buildings. Uh, many things can be done. I think uh, the region just needs to be uh, creative uh, and also to look at a better way to improve uh, highly polluting uh, sectors like transports, uh, industries. I think it would be first steps. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there's two questions here that I think maybe can be addressed by multiple parts um, to uh, multiple panelists. Excuse, uh, sorry. Um, and I think are kind of related to one another. Um, so there's one question, Florence, which I know you've uh, flagged as wanting to answer live about how um, to minimize the impact of climate change on Bedouins living in the desert. Um, and I think there's also another question uh, from Kenzie about how climate finance or how will it reach the most vulnerable communities, people living in precarious housing, et cetera. Um, so I think we can maybe uh, consider how, or ask the question of how climate change is going to affect some of the most vulnerable people. And also some of the most vulnerable people in the Middle East are uh, people who are living cultural lifestyles like the Bedouins in the desert, like the, Mar like the Marsh Arabs, uh, many indigenous people in North Africa. So. Um, maybe Florence, you can start. Okay, so the problem with Bedouins is that um, most of the time they live off herding and um, animals obviously will need plants to feed off. And when there's less water or no water, then they don't have what they need. So um, that means, I mean, that's a, that's a food issue, but it's also an income issue. So um, one of the things that can be done, well, the first thing is let's think ahead. Let's not wait until these people have lost their jobs and then arrive uh, in a big city where they will not be able to find jobs or fit in. And then you have a whole uh, range of other issues, you know, conflict, et cetera, coming. So that's, I think, the first thing. Um, what's really important, and that's why some of the, one of the things we issued, uh, we wrote in the report, is that the states in the region, civil society in the region, they talk to each other and share ideas because, um, you know, Europeans are doing their thing and they're talking to each other, but clearly we have no clue uh, how to manage deserts because we don't have any. Um, but I think that would be a conversation that states in the region have to figure out, A, if they want to stay living in the desert, what are other ways that they could live off? Could you plant different plants? Because for instance, I don't know if you know this, the palm tree, for instance, requires quite a lot of water. Um, and so the UAE, for instance, is now switching to a different tree. I forgot which one uh, along the highways. Of course, the palm tree looks very pretty, but it just needs too much water. So you could think of that. But in some regions, that will also just not be possible. So where can they go instead? Are there areas? Can you think about relocalization? Can you think of, I don't know, perhaps localized energy production as a source of income? You know, uh, if we find a way to get energy um, produced in one place into the national grid, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. So I think. The, the point I want to make is, yes, things are really catastrophic, but this is also a very interesting time to have this problem because so many other solutions are coming to the table. You know, we are moving into renewable energy. We're moving, we have batteries now. We have, we're moving into uh, digital work, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are ways that uh, things can be done, but not everything will be salvageable. And I think that's, that's the bad news. I mean, uh, Salman's video earlier, you know, something like that, it cannot be turned back. And so for some people, there will be things that will be lost and they will not be able to bring them back. So if we don't find a solution, so, you know, where we switch things around, what can we do instead? The important thing is let's have this conversation beforehand. Um, same about vulnerable people. Uh, as always, vulnerable people are, get, get the, biggest, um, the biggest problem delivered. Um, you know, for instance, um, 
uh, we know, for instance, then in the Palestinian territories, um, a lot of the Palestinians don't have access to groundwater, you know, for all the reasons that we all know, um, because the Israelis don't let them drill deep, so they rely on rainwater. Well, guess what's not going to fall as much? Rainwater. So how do you, you know, you're creating a bigger problem further down the line. Um, Again, though, we also see that, look at solar power. Solar power is being increasingly used because it's super decentralized. It, it makes you less dependent on a national grid. So can we perhaps use solar power to improve wastewater management so you can actually recycle some water for, uh, at this very local level in these super vulnerable communities? So as I said earlier, there are solutions. I don't have them all cookie, uh, cut out. Uh, there are more ideas in the report. Um, but it's important that we don't fall into this doom and gloom that nothing can be done. In some cases, really nothing will be able to be done. But it doesn't mean that, you know, one day there will be a huge wave and everybody will drown in the Mediterranean or die of thirst in the desert. We have one currency and that's time. Not a lot, but we have some time. So if we get moving now, I think there's, there's some things we can do. I think that's a really good segue into another two questions that I, I think I would be good to actually combine as well, um, which are about grassroots com contributions during COP27, specifically in the case of Egypt, and also how can we push for um, justice for these vulnerable communities leading up to, um, to the COP? How do we push for these uh, kind of interdisciplinary solutions, these creative solutions, many solutions of which re rely on like cultural knowledge of the area that, like you mentioned, maybe the EU doesn't have, maybe these re research doesn't, uh, don't have. Um, and I will probably direct this question to Shadi and also Salman, if you have anything to add to that, um, the activists of our panel. Um, I would say um, something that is very, very important in Egypt, and I think Nadine is here as well, and she's trying to establish a coalition, a network. Not only Nadine, but also like a couple of uh, of leading organizations in Egypt are trying to uh, to build networks and coalitions of NGOs in order to discuss what kind of topics they want to bring to the COP, how they want to use a momentum around the COP, uh, impacting policies, uh, working with the government, and creating a more sustainable impact than the, the than the COP activities, which is, I think, very, very important, like how we as environmental organization like organize and have like more of a unified agenda and how can we bring this forward to the policymakers. So this is very important. And also, I, uh, I would say that the representation of different communities is not necessarily only environmental organization because there are different organizations that work with uh, uh, women uh, who are uh, specifically working in farming. Uh, there are organizations that work in tourism. Those organizations need to be brought on the table and need to be consulted. Uh, local communities need to be brought on the table and need to be consulted. So uh, I think it's the issue of representation is very, very important. There is a lot for the international communities that can can do in order to uh, support with the representation the cop process of itself is very very limiting it's very very hard for local organizations and for for uh, representatives of vulnerable communities to be involved so they are not invited to the table uh, certain specific organizations uh, individuals high profile people are always invited to the table uh, this is something that we're getting a lot from the people from egypt right now not only from egypt but from different countries around the mina look at the, the representation the cop from the arab region in terms of ngos uh, in comparison to other countries you're going to see the inequality uh, and also those organizations how what they are focused on and what kind of communities do, do they represent so it's very important to open the door for uh, a bigger representation uh, for the vulnerable community, and then let them speak of what they want. This is uh, this is not for me like to say what people want, but they need to be represented to be able to express themselves and like put their demands on the table. Salman, is there anything you would yeah. add to that? as an activist, someone who's been an activist for over ten years now? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the 
for this question. Actually, we 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 as Humad Dijla and the civil society here in Iraq, we always pushing to put the environment uh, issues in a top in a, in a top of priority here in Iraq because here in Iraq they always looking for security, looking for something. They didn't look for in, in the beginning they didn't look for the environment, but right now there is a lot of NGOs. They start to think about environment and how they can help with this. Even the the organization they are working on nonviolence or the organization they are because the nonviolence there is a, how to use the water for the peace building. This is one of the topics that they are working on also. Anyway, I want to mention also we in Iraq right now, also we are raising these points under the umbrella of the Iraqi social forum, because the Iraqi social forum is a big umbrella in, in, in almost all the governments here inside Iraq. And they are they are working with the all with, with the many baths, many masar, like with the women, women rights, uh, and the water rights, with the worker rights, social justice rights freedom of speech so all of them we are pushing all of them to be part of the movement of how we can work with the local authority and with the with the federal government to help to solve a lot of those challenges that we face it through the climate change thank you thank you salman and i think this will be probably our last question um uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, this is something you both kind of touched upon uh, as well already with your answers. But how do you see us? Um, how do you see alliances developing between activists in the region between countries? Uh, what is your perspective of that? What is your experience of alliance making alliance building in the region? Um, and this is something you've kind of, yeah, already touched on a bit, but Shadi and Salman, what are your opinions on collaborating with local authorities, um, collaboration in general between the government and activists, um, and what has been your experience engaging um, with political actors? Um, do, uh, do you want to start, Salman? No, you, you can, you can, yeah, yeah please. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, so I would say that, uh, that especially recently there is across regional uh, partnerships and coalition we have oma for earth like with dream peace no head is also uh, i think attending and like so many uh, coalitions and uh, region work started to uh, uh, to be initiated during the past years so for me this is great because there is a lot to be shared uh, a lot to be shared with uh, iraq uh, palestine jordan like i'm learning a lot because the context is very similar and uh, there is a lot of information and knowledge to be shared. Um, a lot of the global efforts have been focused on um, like sharing between Europe and the uh, MENA region or like global north and global south. But I think it's very important like cross-regional partnerships uh, and also like related to, to state uh, and NGO partnerships. Um, I would say like, like this, is, this is our strategy. We try as much as possible to establish a strong ground in Egypt. We try as much as possible to uh, to have a huge community and a huge representation. And this usually makes the government uh, willing to listen to us, willing to integrate us in the process. And then we try as much as possible to mediate, uh, to uh, to impact this kind of like policy making uh, uh, and also like policy decisions, we try as much as possible to do research work uh, in order to influence policies. Uh, so one one thing that we were involved on re recently was the uh, waste management law with the plastic reduction of single use plastic. Uh, and we have managed like to bring the community in order to impact certain uh, uh, parts of the law. So this was uh, something that, that happened recently. Um, yeah. Salman, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, thank you, well, yeah. yeah, thank you much. Thank you, Shadi. Yeah, uh, as 
I think I think Shadi mentioned all the main points, but I just want to mention also we 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 here in Iraq uh, also we have we we built last few years we built a good network here at least in the Mesopotamia region and actually between 2019 and 2020 also we built a good connection with the with the activists from Ecobis from Jordan and also we have a good contact with the Water Kibar Alliance and even uh, with Lebanese, but I would love to work also this year to start work together with Shadi to build a new network between between uh, this, uh, between North Africa and this area of Middle East. Would love to. Thank you. Amazing. I think we perhaps have time for one more question, um, which is, so I'll just take the last question that we actually have. So can Salman tell us a bit more about the margins of maneuver um, the Iraqi government has had as far as water management is concerned? So if you can just tell us a bit about, um, I guess this ties into uh, the political impact um, that uh, the political dimension uh, of climate change and climate risks in Iraq. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. Actually, is is a good to raise this question right now because uh, during all the time from Saddam regime time till now, we don't have any uh, any uh, proper negotiation with those two countries at least to build an agreement to work on this agreement for our new generation. Uh, and until now, the, the Iraq government, they, they want to start any negotiation, but with, with the Iranian side, there is no accepting, never ever to accepting any negotiation about water issues because they are pushing to do something like related with the economic issue because uh, with the economic issue and working on oil and putting too much of economic issues to do it before to talk about water here to give you at least some of your water and this is this is what 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 they are doing through Iranian side Turkish side they are accepting but uh, the negotiation for two years until now there is no outcome and there is nothing happened till now helpfully uh, uh, last two weeks there is uh, there is a statement from the Ministry of water resources in Iraq they said the the, the new round of of negotiation with Turkish government will start in February. So hopefully this year we will find something at least to have some water for, for our new generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salman. I think that, I think with this, we've kind of reached time um, as well. I'm conscious of the interpreters as well. Um, so, I think we should we can end this webinar on that note. I want to say thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, it's been so incredibly insightful hearing from you all today um, and really initiating this conversation um, with this uh, with this report, with your perspectives. I really hope we can continue to engage with your work um, and your activism and we can continue to hear from you all. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended the event. Thank you for making the time uh, to come. I really hope, um, especially for those of you who will be reading the report, you can um, envision some of these local perspectives as well and continue to engage with these issues and maybe have some inspiration as well to mobilize and engage with activism um, thanks to the t some, of the, some of the things we've learned from Shadi and Salman today. Um, we are going to continue to convene these events as part of the environmental politics program. Um, we do roughly two events a month uh, for those of you who would like to continue um, engaging with our work and engaging with our topics. Um, and we'll definitely be exploring further um, the topics we've engaged with today um, in the next couple of events um, and the next few months. So thank you again to our speakers, to our attendees. Thank you to the EUISS for partnering with us for this event um, and to our interpreters, of course, and everyone at ARI who has helped organize this. Um, and with that, I will say I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you again. <laughs>